The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you all for joining us today for our webinar on policy guidance for smart energy saving consumer devices. We'll be starting in just a few minutes. We'll, we'll give the other participants uh, a moment to join. Thank you. Olivia, let's start. Yes. Okay, Olivia, are we live? It's okay, it's okay. Go. Okay, thank you. So, thank you all for joining us today for our webinar on policy guidance for smart energy saving consumer devices if we could click the slide forward thank you i'm vita rosita from the energy efficiency division of the international energy agency and i'm joined by my colleague emmy bertoli we'll be moderating the webinar today i hope that you your families and friends are well and remain so we are still in an unprecedented situation. The IEA is hard at work on developing analysis and policy recommendations to support governments, especially on how economic stimulus can be strategically used to support clean energy transitions. We are also continuing to focus our work on digitalization and power system modernization and how to ensure efficient operation and continued resilience of power systems. This is the sixth webinar in our series on modernizing energy efficiency through digitalization, where we are focusing on how digital solutions can make end use energy efficiency cheaper, easier, more appealing across sectors, how they can make policy making more effective through access to more granular data, to new types of data and advanced analytics, and on how digital technologies can promote energy efficiency across systems including electricity systems. 
In today's webinar, we will have the opportunity to explore how digitalization and increased connectivity and controllability can support end user energy efficiency and provide a valuable flexibility resource to power systems. We'll look at the opportunities and delve into the actions that are needed to be taken already today to ensure that the benefits can be captured. I'm very pleased to have Steve Belletich with us today. He's the operating agent of the Electronic Devices and Networks Annex of the International Energy Agency's Technology Collaboration Program on Energy Efficient End Use Equipment. He'll guide us through the topic and share highlights from a study that the group has recently published. And uh, we'll follow this by a question and answer session. If we could have the next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, so please do use the chat box in your control panel for, for any questions. And we'll select and read out questions at the end of the presentation. We'll not mention the names of the people asking questions. And please also use this opportunity to suggest further topics or aspects that you would be interested to hear more about in future webinars. This webinar is recorded and the recording and the presentation will be available online. Once it's online, we'll send uh, all registered participants in an email with the link. And with that, uh, it's, it's my great pleasure to hand over to Steve to, uh, to help us navigate through this uh, exciting topic. Thank you. Thank you, Vida. And thank you so much to you and the IEA for the opportunity to, to give this webinar. Uh, I hope everybody's well, and I hope you're enjoying the IEA's webinar series on digitalization as I am. So as Vida said, I'll talk today about smart energy saving consumer devices, and I will explain what they are in a moment, and also how policies can guide those devices to uh, aid in the digitalized energy system. Thanks also to Guidehouse, who authored a report uh, on which this uh, presentation is based. Uh, you'll see a link there uh, on our website to the report. If you want to download it, you can and, um, and flick through it while listening to the webinar. I'll uh, first introduce uh, my organization and the topic, and then talk about the importance of devices and then what policies can be developed and what policies need to contain to encourage these devices. So first of all, uh, as Vita said, I work for the Electronic Devices and Networks Annex. Uh, it is an annex of the, uh, the 4ETCP, the, the IEA's Technology Collaboration Program on Energy Efficient End Use Equipment, or 4E. However, 4 e and ED are not part of the IEA, rather we form a collaboration with the IEA. And the EDNA Annex is focused on providing technical and policy guidance for energy efficiency for connected devices, that is devices connected to the internet, and also the systems in which they operate, for example, in a smart home. We have 14 member countries and I'm the operating agent. So we really look at the, uh, the energy implications of connectivity of devices, and that's a, that's a double-edged sword. There are energy savings to be had. We sort of classify those in two areas. One is intelligent efficiency, and the other is demand flexibility. And I'll talk lots more about those. But there's also an energy cost. Uh, we call it network standby, and that's the energy used by a device to remain connected to a communications network. Even when the device is not performing its primary function, for example, a light globe, when it's in the off state, a, a connected light globe needs to remain communicating with the ICT network in order to be ready to turn on when a signal is received. Well, I won't talk much about this today, the energy cost, but it's something that we, that we do a, a lot of work on. There's more reports on our website that, that talk about that. I want to talk more so about the energy savings available from smart energy saving connected devices. And these are in two areas, intelligent efficiency and demand flexibility. So what are those two topics? Um, some jargon here, intelligent efficiency. It is really the operation of a system of connected devices so that they respond to changing conditions of the external environment in order to maximise energy savings. For example, the control of lighting and HVAC systems based on sensors for occupancy, temperature, weather forecast, that kind of thing. However, 
intelligent efficiency is more than just a building management system. The system itself is intelligent. It can optimise lighting and HVAC systems and learn about the best ways to save energy. Often uses sophisticated adaptive algorithms in the cloud and even artificial intelligence. And the best example I can give you for an intelligent efficiency system is a, is a smart thermostat. It's on a uh, sort of on a smaller scale, in, you know, in a household can controlling the HVAC system, but these are now widely available. They can collect occupancy, occupancy information and apply sophisticated adaptive algorithms to control heating and cooling in order to save energy. So that's one thing that's available now and a very, very smart piece of equipment. The potential for intelligent efficiency is large. Uh, in buildings, for example, up to 10% of total building energy consumption can be saved. It is estimated using intelligent efficiency. Uh, in industry, 30%. So there are big savings to be had sort of over and above making each item of equipment more efficient, but operating the system of devices in these buildings and industry in an intelligent way. The second, um, and I call it energy saving, although demand flexibility is, I suppose, not strictly speaking an energy saving, but it is changing uh, electricity usage. End, end use customers changing their usage from their normal consumption patterns in response to changing market conditions. In other words, they're, they're changing their energy consumption responding to what the grid wants and what the grid needs. And there are three uh, aspects of this. Load shedding, which is essentially just lopping off load, fairly crude. Load shifting, which is changing the time of use of a load from peak times to non-peak times. And the third one is modulation, where on a, on a much smaller type scale, devices can respond to the grid or any sort of in seconds or sub-seconds to uh, help support the grid um, voltage and, and frequency stabilisation, that kind of thing. So there are really three things um, that demand flexibility uh, can do. And as I said, we sort of loosely include this under the heading of energy saving. Examples, uh, two examples here in Finland, 1900 domestic uh, boilers used to balance electricity supply. And Southern California, a 200 megawatt aggregated demand flexibility portfolio run by Southern California Edison. There are two examples there. These examples are becoming uh, more common and there are more pilot programs. And uh, this aspect, this demand flexibility opportunity is expected to grow uh, in the coming years. In the residential sector, this is just looking at households. The, uh, the opportunity for demand flexibility is expected to, to really triple um, over the next eight years or so. And there's a lot going on in North America and in Europe. And there's uh, you know, some things going on in other parts of the world, Asia and Latin America, but there's lots of potential um, to, to expand those opportunities in those, in those areas. I know the IA are working hard um, in some of these developing economies to try and get this digitalization topic off the ground. So there's things will happen and we hope will happen. Markets be created for demand flexibility and intelligent uh, ecosystems, you know, come to the marketplace. But we also um, need to talk about devices. But before we do that, I sort of tried to uh, come up with a vision for a digitalized energy system under these two uh, opportunities. So for demand flexibility, all major energy using devices, batteries and electric vehicles are able to perfectly match electricity demand with the supply of renewable energy. And for intelligent efficiency, intelligent adaptive systems of connected devices eliminate every last drop of energy wastage from households and businesses. So this is the kind of uh, vision we're sort of hoping to achieve. And this is just in those two areas. There are lots of others under the heading of digitalization where, where energy use and energy production and energy transmission can be transformed um, using digital technologies. Now onto the devices. Um, connected devices, that is devices connected to the internet. Uh, you might have heard the expression, the internet of things. Those devices that are sort of becoming connected to the internet, 
the uptake of those is expected to grow, the sales of those expected to grow significantly. This is a graph here of sales per annum, estimated and projected into the future. Lots of different devices, you know, smart uh, voice activated speakers being a big category as well, but also lights, appliances, um, um, security, that sort of thing. You know, lots of different Internet of Things type gadgets that are expected to be sold over the next decade or so. And that's all great. However, not all devices are created equal. It's one thing for a device to be connected to the internet, but that doesn't necessarily make it smart and that doesn't necessarily make it ready to participate in demand flexibility and intelligent efficiency. My example here of the electric toothbrush is a nice gadget, but it's not necessarily something that has an energy saving or demand flexibility potential. So while lots of devices are sold today that are, that are not connected and, and are not smart, and, and lots of them can last many years, if I buy a water heater or an air conditioner or a refrigerator, that can last 10, 15, 20 years. And while demand flexibility and intelligent efficiency initiatives are expected to gather momentum, devices that last a long time can be locked out of these opportunities in the future because they're just not ready to participate in these kinds of initiatives. And this is why we sort of talk now about policies for these devices and how they can help these devices be, be future-proof so that when uh, demand flexibility, intelligent efficiency initiatives do come uh, more so to the market, our devices will be ready, uh, even though they've been sitting there for a few years already. But to do that, of course, we need policies and we need quite sophisticated policies. We need lots of different actors to get involved, not only government policy makers, but manufacturers, utilities, the ICT industry, researchers and academia, industry associations, standards organisations, all have a role to play in this complex area of making devices smart and energy saving. So what kind of guidance can we give these people to help them start the journey of devising policies for these devices? So Eden has published a report on which this uh, presentation is based and I'll run through a number of aspects that we came up with to, to help guide policy makers. The first of all is of course um, to devise a product scope. You know, what kinds of devices should be included and be encouraged to become smart and energy saving. Of course, the, uh, the larger devices that use more energy and, and those that last longer um, are great candidates. And this table shows you a table from the report, which is just looking at demand flexibility here and, and a bit of a prioritization of devices and which ones should be included with a demand flexibility bent to, um, to participate in demand flexibility systems. And there are sort of usual uh, suspects there, air conditioners, water heaters, thermostats, and so on. This next slide is actually a, a policy scope from Energy Star. Energy Star are the US or North American program, um, a labeling program for efficient products. And within that program, there is a, an optional connected functionality requirement. So some of the products in that, there are many, many products in that program, but some of them, and they're listed here, have this optional connected functionality requirements. And that is really based around uh, getting them to participate in demand flexibility. There's the thermostat, dishwasher, there's even lighting, um, pool pumps, even ceiling fans is there in the, in the North American program. So choosing the scope, which devices should be encouraged to be smart energy saving is really sort of step one. And the next step is, okay, well, what should those devices do? And there's a, a sort of macro step there uh, to cover all the devices you might want to include in your policy. You know, what should they be doing in general terms? So we came up in the report with a, a definition and it goes like this. A smart energy saving device is a product that has the capability to receive inputs process these inputs and independently take action for the purpose of one or more of demand flexibility, intelligent efficiency and status reporting. Now status reporting is, is one I haven't talked about, but it's really just uh, a device having the means to provide to the consumer 
sophisticated information about the device. For example, alerts for fault conditions or alerts for excessive energy consumption or dirty filters and things like that. Just alerting the customer or the consumer to these kinds of conditions which might lead to increases in energy. So we talk a bit about that in, in our report and there's a more, a more detailed definition there. I've just sort of paraphrased it here. That sort of overarching uh, definition of what functions these devices should, in, should have. But when we get to specific device types, refrigerators, um, HVAC systems, water heaters, etc., we need to then define, okay, well, they, the, the functionality will be different for each of those. And I have an example here of, in Australia, where I'm from, there is a policy for demand flexibility of air conditioners, and the energy rating label has on the bottom right of that label image on your screen there, you can see mode one, mode two, mode three. It has a, indicates to the consumer the kinds of modes that the air conditioner has, uh, and they're fairly crude in this example. Um, mode one, turn on off. Mode two is turned down by 50%. Mode three is turned down by 25%. So fairly crude, um, but works for air conditioners. For other devices, it might, there might be more sophisticated functions specific to that device, uh, maybe deferring uh, use uh, and things like that, but it's really specific to the device. Also worth saying here that it's important that customers, consumers don't lose comfort. We don't want air conditioners to be, to be switched off by utilities um, and the customers to lose amenity. So that's got to be carefully managed as well. Then, of course, in order to verify you know, those functionalities and, and whether or not the devices um, meet those and can perform those functionalities, there needs to be you know, test methods. And there is, uh, they're, they're, these often need to be written uh, from scratch. And I've given an example here in the Energy Star program I talked about, there is a test method to validate demand response capability. So that kind of thing needs to, uh, an actual test method that a device can be put through to prove that it will indeed provide the, the, demand, the demand flexibility functionality that's required by the Energy Star program. So that's functionalities and test methods. The next one is communications protocols. And devices, of course, need to communicate with the outside world in order to be controlled, either by a, uh, for example, a utility in a demand flexibility program, or maybe it's controlled by a, a central brain in an intelligent efficiency um, ecosystem. So communication is an important uh, function, of course. And there are, we talk a lot about open communications protocols, and I'll explain that in a moment. But first of all, it's, it's worth understanding there are two sort of layers of communications protocols. Um, these often get confused. The first one is, a, is what we call a network layer. It's the means of communication. And the analogy I use, it's the telephone network. If I'm talking to someone on the phone, I'm using the telephone and the telephone and the telephone network is the communications layer in that analogy. Sorry, is the network layer in that analogy. It's used to transmit and receive data. In the world of devices, protocols like Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Bluetooth and Ethernet are the network layers that devices use to communicate. Then there's a layer called the application layer. And the analogy with the phone is the language that I speak. So I'm talking to someone on the phone and I'm speaking English. And if they don't understand English and they only understand Russian, then that's a problem. And that language is the application layer. And it determines which products and platforms the device can communicate with. And we sort of give this the heading of interoperability. We want to make sure, or well, the feeling is we want to make sure devices are interoperable so that brand X and brand Y appliances can be controlled by one single interface and using one single platform. And the, the expression vendor lock-in is, is one which is uh, worthy of more thought because often device manufacturers will want to lock customers in to an application layer. In other words, a, a means of communicating with their devices that other devices won't be able to use. So that is a problem, of course, for if you want your whole house to be full of 
energy saving intelligent devices, you want them all to operate on one system with one user interface so you don't have multiple. So that's a that's a problem. Um, but there are standards aimed at facilitating openness, openness in these protocols. Uh, the ISO and IEC have one, a framework called interoperability for IoT systems. There's other grid specific grid specific ones that I've listed there. So there is work being done to try and get these application layer protocols to open up so that lots of devices can work using, using one system and interoperate. Another complex topic, data privacy and security. And this is something that consumers we know are very concerned about. How their private data is stored, accessed and used. Is a, is a big concern to consumers and, and we know this because you know, they've told us. For example, data misuse. I don't want my smart fridge to tell my health insurance provider what I'm eating. So that's my example for how data can be misused and, and, and that's a logical need that I have. And the same applies to energy related data. We don't want data being used in ways that consumers have not authorised or haven't even thought about. There are, however, some regulations addressing this. For example, the European Telecommunications Standards Institute Cybersecurity Standard for Consumer IoT Devices. These require regu uh, regular and frequent revision, and they need to be clearly, con clearly uh, communicated to consumers. Consumers need to know in simple language how their data will be used. So that's sort of uh, protection private data, but there's also cyber security, which, is in, which relates to hacking of devices to get, to get data out and to get access to other systems. And again, there are some, this is more of a much, uh, much more of a technical issue and there's work being done um, in North America and elsewhere on trying to come up with some standards and, and cyber security protocols to protect devices and the systems those devices operated in from, from hacking essentially. The next one, and there are nine in total, uh, the next one, number seven, is one that's close to my heart and that's usability. So devices, smart devices have to be usable. Policy makers might want to require or maybe suggest in their policies that devices plug and play, that they are easy to set up and they connect to the wireless network uh, simply and easily and remain connected to the wireless network. Something I've had a lot of problems with, with uh, IoT gadgets is getting them on the wireless network and getting them to stay on the wireless network. Devices you know, really need to be straightforward to operate and also user overrides. Uh, this is particularly applicable to demand flexibility uh, initiatives where Consumers might want to have the ability to, or, or will want to have the ability to override uh, instructions from the grid. So if the grid asks them to uh, turn their device off, uh, Energy Star in their specifications say that the consumer has the ability to override that request and that override will last for 72 hours. So that's, that's Energy Star building in uh, a user override to their specifications. And then once we have all those things thought about in, in our policy, then how, how would a policy maker, for example, a government agency deliver this? Would they say, okay, uh, all devices sold, or all devices within a certain um, category, refrigerators, for example, shall, um, shall be uh, energy, shall be smart and energy saving and able to participate in demand flexibility and intelligent efficiency? All of them, or perhaps is it only ones, is it only IoT devices that are already connected to the internet? Is it only those that we should make sure are, are able to participate? Should these kinds of policies be bolted on to existing device efficiency requirements, such as minimum energy performance standards and labelling? Um, there are examples where, such as the Australian example, where the, the existing energy rating label has a little section on to indicate the demand flexibility functionality of the air conditioner. That's one way of doing it. Energy Star, use a voluntary label um, or use a, a voluntary aspect within a voluntary label to indicate and encourage 
uh, these kinds of uh, connected uh, functionalities. Uh, there's a, the, the SG Ready label there is a German example, uh, smart grid ready heat pumps, a label used in Germany. The SRI one is actually for buildings. It's a smart readiness indicator in Europe for buildings. But I thought an interesting example of a label uh, applied to a building, which, which might be applied to a, uh, an appliance or a device as well. Of course, financial incentives would be nice to uh, incentivise customers to purchase and operate these kinds of devices. And demand flexibility uh, you know, is about creating markets and paying customers to participate in demand flexibility. Also, industry self-regulation is another aspect worth thinking about in terms of how to get the, you know, the policy into the marketplace. Last uh, but not least is uh, not to forget about network standby. So the energy used by the device to remain connected to the internet or connected to uh, some sort of communications network. And this is a, 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 light, a light globe here, uh, off mode using uh, 2.9 watts, which is, which is quite a lot of power when it's not producing any light. And you know, this, is a, this is a 15 watt LED light globe. Uh, if it uses 15 watts for two hours a day when it's on, but it uses three watts for the other 22 hours a day when it's off, then the, the total energy consumption becomes comparable to almost to an incandescent light bulb. So we certainly want to make sure that when trying to encourage smart energy saving devices that we make sure they don't use too much energy to communicate. So in summing up, I hope that wasn't uh, too much information to absorb, but to try and sum up, demand flexibility and intelligent efficiency initiatives will gather momentum, it's predicted, and that is already happening. We need to ensure devices are not, not locked out of this opportunity, especially devices that last a long time and use a lot of energy. The policies are required to encourage this, and there are multiple stakeholders need to be involved in that. And there are so many issues to consider when developing these kinds of policies, and I hope our report will provide uh, some guidance for policymakers, not just governments, but manufacturers and associations and researchers and academics to what they need to think about when thinking about these kinds of policies that can encourage smart energy saving devices. So thank you. Uh, my contact details are there. Another link to the report on which this presentation is based and also the Edna Publications Library has uh, many similar, uh, similar documents that deal with policies for, for these kinds of smart devices, both to save energy and to make sure they don't use too much energy to be connected. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve, for this excellent overview and uh, in hel helping us uh, get an understanding of, of the magnitude of opportunities, but, but also of uh, the, the very important uh, steps that, that need to be taken across the whole value chain to make these uh, opportunities a possibility. Uh, let's open up for uh, the question and answer session and my colleague Amy will be helping, helping me answer, uh, ask the questions. Uh, let's start off, Steve, by uh, looking at consumers. Um, you've explained uh, technically what's what's feasible, what's possible, but uh, will will consumers be interested in intelligent efficiency and uh, demand flexibility, and and what what needs to be done further to to make this appealing? Yeah, that's an that's an excellent question. Uh, there are there's lots needs to be done. Not just I've talked today about the device, the technicalities of the device aspect, but of course there's, there's lots of other things that need to be done. Consumers, of course, um, we know are not all that interested in energy saving. They, we, we, they may be more interested if their utility will pay them to, uh, to change their energy usage patterns of their devices. So that's a, that's a financial incentive that, that can uh, be significant. But also I think we need to package this up with the other benefits that smart devices offer. Of course, you know, smart devices are sold with the benefits of comfort and better security and better convenience 
and we need to continue to sell them on those benefits but also add energy into these devices so in fact energy is not the number one selling point it's a it's a bonus but the devices come with lots of other benefits so i think we need to sort of package it up Thanks, Yeah. So to proceed uh, on to the next question, uh, we, we are moving back a bit to, to the overall system. We have seen that there are many pieces actually to the puzzle, uh, but we would like to ask you, what else do we need to do to create uh, the, the digitalized energy system, so an overall digitalized energy system? Uh, yeah, there are lots of things, um, and there, there, as I said, there, there are many pieces to this puzzle. I know the IEA are working on on many aspects, but in this, in the context of devices, you know, especially with demand flexibility, we need to build build markets for demand flexibility. So, while there are some uh, small scale and pilot programs of utilities in, in various parts of the world that are trying to create these markets, I think there's a lot more can be done. Uh, by policymakers and governments and regulators to to help these markets be created, so that customers, households, and businesses can participate and can be paid to reduce their energy consumption or to shift their energy consumption. That's just that's a very complex market, of course, and it's just not going to happen um, automatically. There's a lot needs to be done. Rules written um, for aggregators that can aggregate this kind of demand and flexibility, um, that kind of market creation, I think it, it is a big one. Thanks, Steve. And, and so moving back to the topic of uh, standards. So to achieve widespread demand flexibility, we we need to standardize the the language of connected devices as as you you explained to us um could could you provide a bit more insights on what efforts are being made worldwide to enforce interoperability and and what further could policy makers do to um ease this transition because as 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 we know not all manufacturers are uh, are keen to embrace open source protocols, and and there are still uh, on, ongoing sort of, uh, product developments using uh, proprietary protocols. Sure. Well, I, I think certainly in the area of demand flexibility, I, I think that this job is a little easier in that if a device wants to participate in demand flexibility you know it, it will be required to to use the protocol that the utility wants to use um, so of course you know step one is we want all utilities um, to use the same protocol and there are efforts um, uh, around to, to try and do this um, such as the open ADR alliance where they're trying to standardize the language that is used to control these devices. So that's one, two sides. One is, you know, utilities um, developing and and using open protocols, and then getting the uh, manufacturers to do this to do the same to, to make sure that their devices will respond to those protocols. But you know, one possible um, solution here is to even have translators so that uh, you know translate between protocols. So even though a device um, you know, may not, uh, my device from brand X may not work on the on the iPhone app I have from brand Y, but um, both brand X and brand Y will respond to the signal sent from the utility for demand flexibility. So it, it doesn't have to be a winner take all. I think um, certainly with demand flexibility, just letting the devices um, respond to a, to a protocol that's agreed upon for demand flexibility, I think, is one step that can be taken. And indeed, there are efforts around the world. Uh, one of my slides there had a list of these kinds of efforts, um, certainly in North America. So I, I certainly have hope that, that we're making some progress in this area. Thanks, Steve. Um, 
Great, thanks, Steve. Um, and then uh, you're talking about the need to define product scope when when looking at policies. Um, what about the option of uh, regulating or creating standards by function, uh, which could be a possibility for ensuring that uh, policymakers or, or standards organizations don't miss out new innovations? So, for example, uh, when, when developing an approach, uh, the, the standards organizations or policymakers would remember smart chargers, but forget to include smart cables for electric vehicles that might have the same function. Uh, is, is there any work or thinking ongoing around functionality and, and could this be a, a potential approach? I think so, and this is one of the challenges here is that you know, devices and products are evolving very quickly in this space, and it's very hard to sort of keep up, you know, to keep expanding your scope to, in, to include them. So some sort of um, you know, what we call horizontal approach uh, might, be, might be worthwhile, where you, you do indeed sort of define not the product because it's, it looks like this and it's this kind of shape, but it does this function. Um, or, or in general terms, yeah, provides this kind of function is one way of capturing um, a broader scope. So, you know, I think that's certainly one thing that policymakers um, have been challenged with, particularly now where Internet of Things devices are, are changing so rapidly and there's new categories of devices every day. And um, so some sort of um, horizontality of, of policy I think um, is, is useful in, in, in trying to capture as many devices as you can and also to future-proof the policy against new kinds of devices that might, might come up you know, uh, tomorrow. Okay, so thank you, Steve. Now, moving to, uh, let's say, the current situation, I guess most of us are working from home and there are a couple of interesting questions related to telework and how it is uh, actually affects uh, this concept of home devices. In particular, um, our audience is asking us, what is the current scenario as a result of home-based offices? If there are uh, new perspectives about the concept of home devices as a result of telework, and if we should expect joint public-private initiatives aiming at smart devices as a result of, uh, of this growing telework scene. Yeah, and that's an excellent question too. I mean, this um, again, I know the IEA has done a lot of work on this recently. Um, the, the, you know, the energy implications of, of, of the COVID situation, and of course, you know, lots of us working from home um, and being there during the day when normally there's nobody there during the day. So, you know, what does that mean for energy consumption? And of course, it's going to change uh, the patterns of, of residential and non-residential energy consumption. And how um, smart devices might play a role in that? Well, I would imagine that um, daytime residential energy consumption from, from households is going to go up or has gone up significantly. Um, is that creating a problem um, in, in various parts, localised parts of electricity grids, possibly? Um, what can be done about it? That's, that's an excellent question. I think, uh, you know, given the, you know, given the, 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 you know, this has, has led to a proliferation in, you know, I see more ICT in, in homes. Um, trying to buy a, uh, I found myself trying to buy a large computer monitor is impossible in my country because they're all sold. So there's a lot more um, ICT equipment going into homes. There's uh, things being done um, to improve the bandwidth of the internet so we can all um, video conference from home. And there's a lot going on at very high speed. and. Uh, so we should really think about, well, what does that mean for demand flexibility, intelligent efficiency? If this continues, if there's more working from home, are there ways we can capitalise on that and are there ways we can make sure that we're not creating fresh you know, grid constraints and things like that? But the, the, the principles um, that I've discussed today will apply. You know, the, the, if, we, if we want to make sure that you know our, our home energy use does not cause problems, then it's probably even more important that residential energy saving smart devices are a part of our lives. 
Thanks, Steve. So, so following up on, on the issue of uh, residential versus commercial loads or other loads, uh, from, from your perspective, is consumer uptake the real barrier or is it market access? And if so, is, is it the cost of bringing residential consumer dem demand flexibility capacity to the market more of a barrier? Um, if, if given the small loads of consumer devices relative to larger industrial and commercial loads, don't we have a situation where the residential loads are destined to remain uncompetitive? Yeah, no, it, it's it's a challenge. Um, you know, if you, however, if you aggregate, sort of answer the the latter part of that question. If you can aggregate those consumer loads, for example, the the program in in Finland, you know, with two thousand boilers, uh, small, I know, but if you can aggregate many thousands of boilers, you you have an industrial size load. Um, but of course, you've got to create the, the market conditions such an aggregator will um, be created and, and go out and find those customers and sign them up. And there's um, rebates and financial incentives will flow. You've got to create those markets. So it's not, not an easy thing to do. But if we really, if we want to have an energy grid with lots of renewables on it, we, we really have to do this. So we have to have a a demand flexible grid, not only for industries and, and offices, but for households as well. So um, it's something that, you know, that that's been recognised that you know it has to be done, and 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 the markets have to be created, and the devices have to be made um, uh, to participate. Those things, those things all, all all have to be done. So it's just the, the challenge, of course, is for uh, policymakers like ourselves to a create those markets. And B, especially you know um, where it's difficult, such as households, and and B um, provide the the, the technical uh, the the functionality of smart devices to participate in those markets. So it's it's definitely a, a two pronged challenge. And and do you see standardisation as as a pathway for reducing costs for for residential demand response uh, demand flexibility? I think so. I, I, I think as as ever, standardisation, you know, is key. You know, so that devices can talk the same language, have similar functions, so that when they're asked to do um, uh, function X, they can provide function X. They understand what function X is, and will give function X. Um, then, you know, that's standardisation effectively. There's, there's no point in each um, each brand or device thinking function X is something else. They all need to understand what function X is and, and deliver function X. Thank you, Steve. So to follow up on this, uh, perhaps you, you already partially answered to the, this question, um, but we're actually uh, wondering uh, in relation to commercial and industrial and multifamily residential opportunities, um, our audience was wondering if you see greater or lesser opportunities versus single family homes. And um, our audience also asking if you could perhaps elaborate a little bit more on uh, intelligent energy devices, particularly targeted at low cost houses. Yeah, I, I suppose um, just sort of thinking um, aloud here, I suppose with, with low cost housing, you know, especially where it's built by a, um, a local government organization or, or a community organization, they have, um, because they often will own the building um, and provide all, all the, the water heaters and the, and, and the air conditioners and so on, then there is an opportunity there for that, for that one single um, owner of that equipment, the building owner, local, local council or, or community housing organisation to, um, uh, with one transaction to sort of sign up to some sort of um, demand flexibility initiative. So that, that's perhaps one opportunity there um, where we can capture many customers more easily than we might by trying to sort of chase down each and every one of those dwellings. Uh, so that's just thinking off the top of my head, but uh, you know, as always, it's a, you know, it, it's a challenge where people, um, you know, people have, have lots on their, on their plate uh, in their homes. They're, you know, trying to make ends meet. And, and pay their bills, and you know this this may be something which is um, 
just another uh, annoyance or, or maybe it's something where they um, can get a, a bit of a subsidy you know, to help with with day-to-day -day living expenses. So um, I'm sure there are people that have studied this more than me, but I'm sure there's some some way of, of taking or bringing this sector into this into this kind of marketplace. Thanks, Steve. So, so we've been talking about uh, intelligent energy efficiency, so energy savings and demand flexibility. Uh, is there a competition between the two? Could there be a competition between the two? And, and if there is, how, how can policy or, or other actions help mitigate this competition? Yeah, that is a great question. Uh, I'm not sure I have the answer to that, but um, I haven't thought in detail about that, but maybe, I suppose, and in the end, um, whoever pays more will, you know, receive the benefits. So I suppose if the utility is, is offering a, a big incentive to um, change energy consumption, but that energy consumption change isn't necessarily going to save that customer a large amount on their energy bill and be an actual net energy saving, then I suppose and that customer will, will in many cases, just take, um, take the larger subsidy. In other words, you know, if the utility is offering a, a big incentive to change and um, that overrides um, some sort of energy saving I might have got by doing something else, then I suppose the utility will win. That's my initial reaction to that. Thanks, Steve. And I'll just mention that from, from the IEA side, this is a topic that we're very interested in further exploring. So uh, our, our listeners can expect some, some future research and uh, uh, guidance in that area. Over to you, Amy. Yeah, so um, like in, in the previous questions, we, we saw the role of uh, yeah, policymakers, consumers, uh, and other stakeholders. There is a specific question on what uh, actually uh, national regulation authorities could do to promote the usage of uh, smart energy saving devices and, uh, and what initiatives uh, they could put in place. Sure. Um, well, there's, there's, uh, there's a few uh, you know, kinds of policies that you know, national policymakers, national regulators can can take up. You know, we've talked today about well, for devices, you know, where we regulate them for efficiency and safety and so on. Should we also regulate them for you know, to make them smart and energy saving? We sort of talked a lot about that. But of course, um, there are other things that can be done. And we talked a bit about creating markets for demand flexibility. Again, another sort of market creation exercise on, 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 at the national level. Um, you know, that makes sense. Uh, then, okay, well, can we um, provide financial incentives to consumers to, um, from the government side? You know, can there be um, energy saving um, incentives and rebates and tax breaks and things like that um, that, that can be put in place? Um, you know, there are, there are many uh, government policies available to, you know, to stimulate energy efficient devices and, and you know, similar applies to smart energy saving devices. So we sort of you know, apply the same thing. But at the end of the day, um, you know, regulation um, is, is uh, effective because um, yeah, there's no, no real choice involved. So, so regulation is something that policymakers will often um, be high on, on their list. Uh, but there are of course other, uh, other options, financial incentives, tax breaks, um, industry led, uh, regulation, labelling, you know, those kinds of things, there, there, there's lots of ways. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's a, it's a very, um, it's an ongoing challenge, I think, for, for policy makers to encourage, you know, energy efficiency. It's, it's quite a, uh, quite a difficult thing to, to encourage and, you know, but there are lots of, certainly lots of policy options on the menu to choose from. Thanks, Steve. And, and in your presentation, you showed us a slide with uh, the, the potential of, of a range of different types of appliances. Um, in, in the context of uh, um, selecting the appliances, which could be a priority for standardization or policy making, 
Um, is, is it worth looking at, at small devices? You had this image also in the presentation of, of uh, an electric toothbrush. Well, where do we draw the line? What, what can be included? What, what is it feasible to start with? Yeah, I'm a, I think it's, you know, I think there is a, a prioritisation, you know, that, that needs to happen. So, you know, devices which use a lot of energy and, and therefore have the ability to, um, to, to make big changes, um, both in sort of energy efficiency terms, but also making changes to their energy consumption patterns to suit demand flexibility. So bigger, bigger pieces of equipment, um, I think also important equipment that lasts a long time. It's important to think about because they you know sit there for you know maybe 20 25 years um also uh impacts on comfort are, are important you know we don't want um consumers making large sacrifices of comfort so all those things are important to prioritize and when you get down i, I think really let's deal with the those big ticket items first and then uh you know we worry about you know my phone charger um and and things like that later but um, yeah, I, I think let's get the, the, the big items um, done first and then worry about the small ones. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, so uh, moving on to, to our last question uh, and, and moving, let's say, up to, to our biggest, let's say, energy picture. Uh, it is a fact that today electricity is mainly produced uh, um, through coal. Uh, so uh, our audience is actually wondering if more digitalization actually means that, uh, you know, since, since more electricity is needed, there would be also a more near-term CO2. Um, so uh, could you please elaborate on this and, and maybe perhaps like, tell us what is your opinion on this overall, let's say, a picture and, and how uh, perhaps it is possible to mitigate uh, this level of emissions or uh, on, on what we should, you know, pay attention uh, looking at the overall uh, energy system. Sure. Now, I think I think devices, appliances participating in demand flexibility is, in today's context, is is very much about renewables. So it's about because renewable energy, wind power and and photovoltaic power is is highly variable. Then you know that means we now have a energy supply system which is much more variable than it used to be and if we want to continue to use renewables then we need some way to use that uh, variable supply electricity um, effectively so we want to use the electricity when the when the wind, wind turbine blades are turning and the sun is shining use it and when there's no wind and there's no sun we don't use it um, so that's fundamentally it. So this is all that demand flexibility is, as well as supporting if there's a weakness in the grid we need to worry about because the transmission line is, you know, at, at capacity, you know, that's another factor. But I think the most important thing and the reason, you know, we're talking about this today is so that the electricity loads can help uh, support those renewable energy generators. Thanks so much, Steve. As, as Amy mentioned, we've uh, reached our allocated time for this webinar. Um, th thanks for a great presentation and uh, for answering all the questions that we've been bombarding you with. Uh, we didn't have a chance to answer all the questions that our participants have sent in, um, but uh, we, we did manage to cover the main thematic areas. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, the recording and the presentation will be available online and we'll be sending out an email with the link once we've posted these. And this is a topic area that both the IEA is, is working intensely on and uh, 4E Edna is continuing to work on. So I, I would definitely suggest you to have a look at the, the links provided by Steve and they have a, a few more exciting uh, publications coming out and uh, we'll be continuing our webinar series. We will have our next webinar on um, digitalization focusing on, on finance and the opportunities to use uh, digital technologies and solutions to facilitate uh, finance for energy efficiency coming up on the 11th of June. So please uh, do, do join us then.
And uh, thanks again to Steve for, for this uh, great webinar. And thanks to all our participants. Uh, please stay safe. And of course, thanks to my colleagues, Olivia Parada and Emi Bertoli that uh, um, made this webinar possible. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.